Hey, this DD coming at you from the closet. I am in a closet. I am literally in a closet. You can see some crap behind me. You can see clothes above me. I moved the light in front of me because the light behind you is going to cast a shadow and then your face is in shadow, which doesn't make good watching. But it, as though this makes good watching. But the sound, the sound should be okay. You should have okay sound. Today I'm drinking a little uh, Donald Zeraldo ice wine. This is a 2014 Riesling. Non-alcoholic, of course. So last time, last time we left off, we were talking about world building. We were talking about our groups, our factions, our history, our timelines. We're adding some nature. We're adding some flora and fauna. And we touched briefly on gods. And I said, eh, we'll probably do another video of this, and then this is the bigger video about it. Because people don't really do gods well. Because you do it first. You take a creation as the beginning. So you start with your gods, who either come out of whatever sort of origin story you have, and then they influence the world, work backwards, work from an inverted pyramid style, create your world, and then layer in the gods to fill in gaps, basically. And there's a philosophical argument, the God of the Gaps, and this, it's a good thing. So you talk about, you know, what's happening in your world? What are your players doing? How are they going to get past that tier of mortal play, if you will? The material plane will only bring you so far as far as the stakes. How high can the stakes go when everyone is mortal, you know, abilities are finite? The stakes can only, I mean, with magic, I mean, magic kind of raises the stakes a little higher than normal, but you're still going to plateau. Who are going to cause these big, consequential, cataclysmic events that are appropriate for, like, top tier, fourth tier, the fourth tier, fourth tier, t level 20 play. It has to be these uh, supernatural, extra planar beings. Be they gods, devils, demons, men in the purple hat. I have no idea who the man in the purple hat is. Lovely. So... How do we go about creating gods from this world up instead of the gods down? The civilizations you created, those are the best places to start because you obviously have something. Who cares about them? How are they able to survive? How have the cultures interacted, and how are these different gods interacting? So uh, you can have, and like I said before in the last video, you don't have to have multiple, you don't have to have 12 of these, 12 of the, and, the, and then they have the gods of all these, and you know, you just slot in the god for each race, for each different, this is their god of lightning, this is their god of lightning, this is their god of lightning, no, no. Don't make it like that. Well, I mean, you can, but I don't do it. Think small. Think fewer. Like, for instance, in my campaign, each of the race's gods have consequences in the material plane. Or, like, they're affecting everyday play. Or they're affecting the PCs every time we play. So the elven gods affect the world the most. Or at least, you know, in and in a more more often than the other ones, because they're uh, the ones whom after the days of the week are named, and they also form the constellations. And the the way they became the constellations, there was an ancient battle between the dwarven emperor and the elves, and the elven gods came and were wreaking havoc down on the dwarven army. The dwarven army and their their mages. They um, summoned this shadow dragon to fight with them, and they also discovered the secret 
of the elven god's ability to stay on the material plane, which was a world tree sort of thing. They destroy the tree. The foothold, the anchor to the material plane for the elven gods was lost. They were cast back into the celestial realm where they are the constellations. So that's how the elven gods are in uh, play. And depending on what a certain turtle does with a certain seed from a certain tree, we'll see if they make a comeback. And next we have our dwarves. The dwarves in my world, they were the deified uh, heroes uh, from long ago. So you could find their artifacts around. And so... Basically, I did homebrew magic items with with the dwarves, these dwarven gods with their material realm, material plane, accoutrement. Uh, the spear of, um, oh God, what was his name? You come up with these names and you say, here, here's your spear of, who's my body? Take it. So we have this one character got a spear. One character got the Battle Horn of Dolo, which is this mighty horn. You blow it and you get advantage on fear che- or uh, intimidate checks. And it also has a fun 20% chance to uh, crumble unstable construction and building. So they've blown it in a cave before. That's been hilarious. They've blown it in a rickety like building on fire. That was pretty funny. They blew it in an underground cavern. That was pretty funny. Uh, there were some consequences, and it was funny. I enjoyed it. Uh, I think the players got a kick out of it too. When the walls literally came crashing down all around them. Though they used it to some great effect, clearing like 20 enemies at once. Yes, I like big combat. I'm a big combat guy. So, those were the dwarves. Now, with that, with the half-orcs, yes, the half-orcs, the half-orcs have their own territory. They were a vassal state to the human empire human empire which has now been destroyed the humans have either been exterminated or enslaved or they've fled into the jungle isn't that fun isn't that, am i great i'm not a great story so the half orcs though they were uh originally orcs obviously and this crazy human emperor decided that he wanted to basically breed half orcs and so he forced the intermarriage of humans and half orcs and he created the entire state of what we, I call Talibor, and it's half-orcs. And their god is probably the most recent, because it's basically a, an orcish god who's like, well, I'll, I'll step in for them, I guess. I'll co- go to bat for them. But this god is very angry about what happened. He pities the half-orcs, believes they've been robbed of their, their race, of their birth. And so he's actually an adversary of the party right now, and it makes for some interesting play. But he's literally it for the half-orcs because he's a newer god and the half-orcs are kind of a newer race. So he steps in and is like, hey, look, I'm a here. And I called him Kim, K-E-M, not K-I-M. I realized, that, like, after the fact, that was kind of a weird choice. But uh, I kind of like it. It goes, you know, and there's the Church of Kim, the Plains of Kim, Kim Bregg, the city. Uh, the Church of Kim is, is very powerful in uh, that nation. I'm doing my best to cut down on the amount of times I say um and uh. It's, it's gonna happen. Apologies. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about it in advance. So those were the half orcs. Now the orcs themselves, I haven't made any gods yet. Because they haven't traveled there. There's no reason to. And why am I going to limit possible storytelling or possible um you know plot points? in the future by coming with this unnecessary pantheon of orc gods, you know, Orcus Borcus, God of Forcus, you know, who knows? So, so the orcs have no one. The gnomes have two that were mentioned in passing. Because if you remember that necropolis, I was telling you about in the last one where all the gnomes are, it's their birthright to be buried there. They, uh, there was just two shrines I put on like either side of the entryway into the there's a little fruit fly in here. Where's the fruit fly coming from? Someone dropped some fruit in the closet. Not in my closet, you damn fly. Anyway, so 
there were just two shrines on either side of the entrance. I wrote down the names. I kind of like thought off the top of my head. I was like, oh, the God of Death, God of War, or something like that. I have to look at my notes. I don't even know what their names are. I have to look at my notes. And so, you know, if there's no consequence, don't make there be one. Don't spend time flushing it out unless you feel like you're about to be asked by the players at any moment. You've got to be ready in a moment's notice. Then, you know, revert you back to Fantasy Name Generator. Excellent, excellent system. Turn your ad blocker off for them. Give them the ad money. Really fun on the spot, you know, just click Tavern Name, click group name, click uh, orc, click uh, tabaxi, you know, literally everything, and they're unique. But anyway, I'm not sponsored by them or anything, you know, obviously I'm not sponsored by anyone right now, I'm just a guy rambling in his closet. If someone sponsored me, that would be, that'd be funny uh, (laughs) at this stage. So, you had uh, these uh, orcs with, with no gods, the gnomes had two in passing, the Halflings are kind of who I'm working on right now. So they are now of major consequence. Uh, because of that turtle I told you about, uh, he did an adventure out west. Out west to the western lands off map. So I made my map, but the you know the continents were cut off at the corners. You know, Not the whole landmass was encompassed there. And there is indeed room to go west and east. And, or north and south. And going west... Uh, this turtle did. He found a ring uh, with a cult of halflings. He, they def- the party defeated this cult. Uh, the leader of the cult had a ring on. It was this blue, aquan-looking ring. Puts it on. Starts hearing voices, especially when he's in water. So the water, the voices are really clear, and they basically tell him to go west. Go get your turtle butt west. And so he finds this expedition that's kind of for the, the first people like in recent memory, to attempt going west. What he finds out is that the west is guarded by this magical barrier, and his ring is the kind of the the uh, mark of passage to get him, or rid of passage, whatever the hell, to get him to the west. He gets to the west, he finds a civilization that's a little down the, the totem pole from where he's from, or where the main party's from, and where the main action takes place. So there's like a DLC So he goes, he follows the directions of this voice, he encounters different peoples, he uh, drops some truth bombs on them, like, oh, the truth, oh my god, and he find, he's told he needs to find the, the, the um, headwaters of this river, and so he finds the river and he goes up, he finds, he goes up into the, the highlands. And he finds the source of the river after dealing with a cult of halflings that were there to stop anyone from doing what he did, which is find the god Brovica, who is chained in the headwaters of this river, and who is able to speak to our turtle hero through the water because his voice poured out through this, the river, going out into the sea all the way back to uh, the main area of the continent. Earth. more like the Mediterranean. So, and that's going to have some hilarious consequences. I'm keeping time. There are marked times when they're going to happen. So it's it's going to be funny when the party hears about it later. Uh, I like keeping all the secrets in my in my games. It, it, every <laughs> that might not be everyone's cup of tea, but my my players love it, and they love getting secret texts and messages and doing secret RP sessions after like a after a, a party session ends or just randomly. So everyone's got different crap going on and there's always these big reveals. It's fun. Anyway, so back to deities. So they, so these uh, halfling gods have major consequences coming for, coming down the pike for the, for this, for the party because of this solo quest that the turtle did, the turtle bard. And so now uh, they're flushed out a bit, and then you take um, the last. The last group, uh, major group, is the kobolds. It's five families, very mafioso. Uh, they were kicked out of the mainland by the orcs. The elves took pity on them, took them to this island. They formed basically a pleasure island. It's like you know, a big casino kind of joint. You know, lots of things happen. It's always happening on Dagaroon. 
And so there's these five families, and their deities are dragons. But they're not in the way you think. They're ancestral dragons. So it's it's very... Um, they don't... And they're, the dragons are real, and actually in campaign right now, the dragons are present on the island. Uh, and then that brings another uh, fun issue, and we're delving a lot into dragons. We can kind of count them as... They're not quite to god status, but that's what I'm kind of putting them as. They're very powerful. Um, a lot of them exist in other planes or can travel between planes. I, I, I like to, to, to work with my dragons. I like, to, I like to work with dragons. But the five uh, kobold dragons of the houses um, are at odds with the wild dragons, which outnumber them. Uh, because there's this ideological battle between what, you know, dragons shouldn't be making enemies. <laughs> you know, what the hell is that? That's not a dragon. And the wild dragons, they're not united except in their spies of the kobold dragon or the, the family dragons. And so there's a little interesting dynamic there. One of our players is a kobold. Um, he currently got himself exiled and he has a bounty on his head. And uh, that's fun. So I've been taking pot shots at him from assassins. That's cool. Uh, I like being able to do stuff like that. It keeps them on their toes. Ice wine. Go get some. But only the good stuff. So, well, I've kind of told you about how the deities in my uh, realm work. Now let's turn a little to devils and uh, demons to a little bit. But I focus mostly on devils in my campaign. So I don't homebrew as much on the devil side because D&D very clearly is like, here are the nine levels, and here's the archduke of each level, and here's blah, 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 and there's, here's a stat block for all the uh, archdukes. I'm like, okay, we'll we'll keep it, sure. So, we I use um, Mephistopheles of Cania, the eighth tier of hell. He is my big bad, uh, but his adversary is a duke, just a little under him. That's a homebrew devil that I came up with. Uh, so I talked about how the humans were enslaved and all this stuff, and there's a long history of this stuff. So they go, they went through cycles of enslavement, uh, then being the oppressors, then being enslaved again. You know, so it's just this vicious cycle for the humans. They can't catch a break. But uh, during ancient times, when the humans were enslaved by the dwarves, now they're enslaved by the elves. Crazy world. Uh, but there were these two brothers who sold their soul to Mephistopheles saying, get us out of slavery, let us lead our people out of here, and we'll be yours. Uh, Mephistopheles being impressed with their, um, with their spirit and uh, ability, he granted this contract, he signed this contract with them, and uh, he helped them break loose on the docks of the port capital of the dwarven country nation they were getting all their brethren all their slave brethren there was a massive slave revolt and they were getting them all they were, go- they were taking over ships they were leaving they were going out in the harbor and and then they get down by crossbows at at the uh, docks my players get to witness this through a series of flashbacks uh in in from uh, a devil friend and uh, so they they get warped into this, and then these these twin humans they lose their memory of themselves. They become the the imps, the uh, lowest form of devil. They work their way up through the ranks, and they're finally grant. They they have these inklings of knowledge of each other, and then they finally get this. Uh, blessing from Mephistopheles, where they are allowed to remember their past lives and remember they were brothers, they were twins. And so it's this huge, you know, the story is uh, one of the twins gets killed by Mephistopheles through a whole range of circumstances. The other twin vows revenge, flees to the ninth layer to be under the uh, care of the only person Mephistopheles fears, uh, who's uh, Asmodeus. Some people say Asmodeus. I always like Asmodeus because of the Redwall show. Um, all my Redwall fans out there say yippee ki or you you Eulia, Eulia, whatever, how it ever was said. So so here we have uh, this interesting thing where it's devil against devil, and the devil 
actually tricks my party into helping him and then slowly reveals who he is, but still gets them to go along with it, talking about the consequences if he loses this civil war. Because when his brother was killed, his brother's portal to the material plane exploded with him, and which caused this massive cataclysmic event. And so the party are trying to stop this from happening again, because if this other twin devil, the surviving brother, if he's killed... A cataclysmic event, his portal is going to explode through a volcano on the earth, a twin volcano, and everything goes kablooey again, and there is a second dark winter. That was a lot of exposition about something that makes no sense, really. If you followed that, give yourself a pat on the bat. Pat on the bat. Pat on the back. With a CK, not a T. So yeah, the, I mean, obviously you can get in the weeds with this, but this obviously th- these supernatural beings are involved from the very beginning of the campaign. Uh, they're not explicit all over the place. The, the party's obviously not encountering them, or else you know they'd be way out of balance. Uh, but they are actively influencing the world, and as you go, you can build with your players. You can say, hey, I like uh, you know, what you're doing, what your character's trying to go for. How can I use this in the main plot? So your character makes a deal with, you know, wants to be a warlock, and he makes a deal with the Shadow General. And uh, what are the shadows? What are, who are they allied with? Uh, or who, who are they allied with? Or what are they allied with? And the gods, how do they? How does Kim come in? How do the elven gods come in if they do come in? And that's a wild card. They could be brought into the middle of this, and that's the, one of the pitfalls of a sandbox. If your characters can do anything, if you put it on the table, say this is possible, and they do it, you better you better deliver it some way, some way that's plausible at least. So that was a lot of, about deities. Hopefully, I gave you something fun to think about. Uh, something maybe new to try out. Uh, maybe you just abandon your plans for like 24 God Pantheon for every race. It's not necessary. Make sure every deity you put in, every person, every uh, super supernatural extra planar being, that's my catchphrase, is of consequence, is involved in the plot. If not, don't put them in. Like, I make really no mention of any of the other de- devils of hell. They're there, the shore, if they wanted to talk to them. I think they talked to one, Despater, because one of my players is a tiefling from Dis, so she had a encounter with Despater brief. But, yeah, so, like, but it's really of no consequence too much unless the players are bringing it to the table. And I've done nothing with demons. Who cares? If I if the demons need to come in somehow, they'll come in, and I will worry about it then. And that, I think, is the moral of the story. Don't worry about stuff that, you know, don't worry about problems that aren't there yet. And um, always make sure that your characters have consequences on the plot. Is that proper English? I think you know what I'm saying. I'm saying ice wine is good. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for listening to this rambling video with this great background. Um, you get a little more of the door, I think, now. Uh, but I really appreciate any any likes, any subscriptions you drop. Likes you drop. Script, subscribe, please. Or not. Give me a comment. Tell me if you if you thought anything was uh, weird. If you thought anything was good. If you had ideas, you want to bounce back and forth. Go for it. Uh, one thing about these new channels is you know you get all the attention in the world. But thank you so much, guys, and I'll see you next time.